Today is the Sunday that the church traditionally celebrates the ascension of Jesus. And before I read the passage of this amazing account of the story, I'd like to draw your attention to the slide up on the screen. On the top of Mount Olives, oh, a few hundred feet from the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem, is a very small chapel called the Chapel of the Ascension. Administered by the Muslims since the end of the Crusades when it was built, the chapel marks the traditional site where Jesus ascended into heaven. Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet, so they maintain the site and allow Christians to see what's inside. Well, there's not much, actually. There is a small area set aside, according to tradition, that reveals the footprints of Jesus, the place where he stood before being taken up into heaven. Pilgrims in the medieval period would take home little bits of dust from this site as relics or souvenirs of their Holy Land visit. But just like the pieces of the true cross that you'll find peddlers trying to sell you out in the streets, if you took all of that sacred dust collected over the centuries and put it together, Jesus' foot Prince would be about a size 500. And yet the ascension is vitally important, not only to our understanding of the story of Jesus, but also of the church. Forty days after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus tells his disciples what they are to do next. He has spent three years instructing and training them from this moment, and now the com he commissions his disciples to carry out his work. Here are these words from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward the heavens? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Let those who have ears hear what the Spirit says to the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In a time long ago, 
Actually, it's only been a couple of months, but it seems like a lot longer than that. This little book ruled my life. All the important stuff in my life. The people I needed to see, the places I needed to go, were all written in here. And if I should come up with something spontaneous that I wanted to do, I better check in here first or I could be in a heap of trouble. There was a time when many of us carried a calendar in our pocket, our purses, our briefcases. And then came the digital revolution. And we traded in our calendars and our planners for a PDA, a personal digital assistant. And then here came Steve Jobs with his people at Apple, combine everything together into smartphones. Digital paper are in our heads. Our calendars controlled a huge chunk of our waking hours. Before the pandemic came and changed everything, even as stay-at-home orders have been lifted, most of us still proceed with our lives cautiously, returning out of, our, out of habit to our calendars and our day planners that give us little direction and almost nothing to ease anxiety and certainty our peace of mind. So just imagine how the very first followers of Jesus must have felt about his answer to their question. So what are we supposed to do now? That's what this conversation is all about in Acts 1, today's text. Basically, Jesus is having a final debriefing before he leaves on the trip, a vertical and heavenly one. And of course, his followers have questions. Lord, is this a time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They ask in verse 6. I mean, this question makes perfect sense. They have been on an emotional roller coaster with Jesus the last few days, surely. Surely we can identify with the disciples, right? Waiting for the latest numbers of COVID-19 infections, deaths and the unemployed. When can we our, see our friends and family again without fear of passing this dreadful virus on to them? When can I go back to work? Or do I even have a job? And if I go back, is it really safe? When can we go back to the way things were before? For three years, three years, the disciples have been following Jesus. They heard him talk a lot about a special time to come. He started his ministry telling them that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They listened as he told stories about banquets, about mustard seeds, about treasure buried in the fields, that he said were all ways of describing a new reality that was to come. They were with him when he entered Jerusalem several weeks earlier. They saw the crowd waving palms and shouting praises. By riding a donkey into the city, Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy that announced God's rule and reign. It was a huge statement. Surely, they said to themselves, the time is now. At the Last Supper, they thought he'd nailed it. I will not drink the fruit of the wine again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Next stop, the kingdom of heaven, they must have thought. Well, there was no coronation. There were nails, all right, but they came with the crucifixion and a cross. 
it seemed like everything was over. What now? And then just as quickly as it was over, it seemed it was on again. Jesus is alive. Hope is not lost. Certainly, the kingdom must be coming. So after 40 days of being with the post-resurrection Jesus, who continued to teach them about God's kingdom, he calls them to a special meeting. Now, they must have been nervous. What's he going to say? What is he going to do? And the question that hung in the air that day probably brought the same kind of emotional response from the disciples as we experience. For instance, when the company announces it is reopening in spite of the fact that the COVID-19 virus is still a threat for many, everyone wants to know, do I have a job? Do I feel safe to go back? When the person you're dating says, we need to talk, we want to know, are we breaking up? When a teenager enters a room, head down and says, mom, dad, our heart rate accelerates and we want to know what's happened. For the crowd gathered that day, the tension must have been thick enough to cut with a knife. Now, we want to get this on our calendars now, and if not now, when? They wanted to pencil in Kingdom Day. They want to know which week they need to clear for this world-altering event. They need to know the deadline so they can be sure to be ready. And to all these questions, Jesus gives a rather baffling answer. That's none of your concern. Well, he actually says, it's, says it a little bit more politely, but that's the gist of it. Let me worry about the timing, he seems to say. You just get on and work on the things you're supposed to do. Then he's gone. The disciples and the rest of the followers are left bewildered and staring into the sky. For them and for those of us who live by our calendars and day planners, Jesus' attitude is frustrating to say the least. It's hard to leave things in the hands of God. It's hard to let go and let God take care of the details. It's hard to trust in what we call divine providence to keep promises made. So, so how am I supposed to respond to this? It's not for me to know the time or the season, really? How am I supposed to function with so little information? We've already been doing this for far too long, right? The problem is that the kingdom of heaven doesn't fit in our calendars. Jesus doesn't give us a list of tasks to do that we can put in our phones. Instead, he calls us his followers and to be his witnesses to the end of the earth. The day, time, and place for God to reign, he says, is for him to worry about. And in any event, he doesn't know when it is either. Our concern is to live into the call of God today. We're not cramming for a final exam. We're not trying to meet a deadline before the supervisor in the sky calls us for a performance review. This is a here and now 
everyday issue, and Jesus calls his followers, both those on the hill back then and those of us now, gathered in front of our computers and our phones, to live for him wherever life takes us. Years ago, I lived in a small town on the west bank of the Hudson River, about 20 miles upstream from New York City. My neighbors owned a sailboat, and occasionally they would invite me to go out for an afternoon of sailing on the Hudson River. Now, let me tell you about the Hudson River. It originates 300 or so miles north of the Adirondack Mountains. So by the time it flowed by where I lived, it was filthy. It was polluted with industrial waste. So the fear while sailing in it was not that you'd drown if you fell out, but that you'd die of something much worse. While I certainly never became what you'd call a sea dog, I did get pretty good at jibbing and tacking in order to move the boat either into or out of the wind. And when there was no wind, well, you just waited until there was. Sailing takes some getting used to. First, it isn't efficient. Second, it's hard giving up control of what's happening. We prefer setting course and getting there, wherever there is, without delays or distractions. And third, you have to learn to be patient. Never my strong suit. Wait for the wind and figure out how to set your sails to maximize the wind's power. You have to accept that you have absolutely no control over the wind. You can only respond to it if you're paying attention. So just for a minute, I'd like you to imagine our church as a boat. You have two choices. Is our church a rowboat church, or is it a sailboat church? Rowboat churches depend largely on human effort. When church budgets shrink and membership declines, rowboat churches frantically row, ride harder, row harder against the current, often frustrated and disappointed at their efforts. Sailboat churches, on the other hand, take up the oars, hoist the sails, and rely on the wind of the Holy Spirit to guide them. When we decide to reopen our doors to meet and to worship together again, we know our lives are never going to be the same. Not at home, not at work, at church, in our community, in the world. We probably aren't going to like a lot of what faces us in the new reality. But if we set our sails and wait for the wind of the Holy Spirit, and if we pay attention, it will provide us opportunities to see ourselves and one another in new ways, in a new light. It will guide us to cast aside behaviors and habits that we don't need anymore. Let us be flexible enough to respond to God when he interrupts us when he messes with our calendars and lifts us into holy 
unexpected ministries. In the last chapter of the last book in the Bible, Revelation, Jesus speaks to us again about the coming of God's kingdom. He says, I'm coming soon. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I am coming soon. Thing is, when you sign up to follow Jesus, you gotta have sales. As much as we'd like to be in charge of our own spiritual, personal journey and, and also the mission and work of our church, we have to learn to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. Be patient. And get used to it. It's all a part of the thrill and the challenge of what we call discipleship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.